Hello and welcome back to Dr. Logic, Awkwardly Bell's Logic in her office. In this video, I'm going to introduce to you the last component of our syllogistic proof theory, and that is the hypothetical proof method, not quite a rule, it's, it's a little bit more complex than a single step rule like we've seen in previous videos, and it's called reductio ad absurdum, so the reduction to an absurdity. The basic idea is that if we're trying to prove a particular categorical proposition, and that is, we're trying to show that it has to be true, given the truth of the premises that we have started off with. An indirect route of getting to the truth of that proposition is by assuming that it's false, and then showing that that assumption, that hypothesis, that's why it's a hypothetical method, showing that this hypothesis leads to a contradiction, to an absurdity. If you suppose that two plus two equals five, and then you can show that two plus two equals four and two plus two equals five, but four and five are not identical to each other, this is an absurdity. So this is the kind of background uh, idea behind this hypothetical method. If in trying to show that something is true, you assume the opposite, you assume that it is in fact false and show that that cannot be the case, then the only other option left is that it is true. So what we will do is we will make use of the notion of the contradictory pairs that we talked about in an earlier video. So the fact that an E claim is the contradiction of an I claim with the same terms in the same order and same for the A and O pairs. So the method is that because no proposition and it's contradictory can both be true at the same time. If our other proof rules are sound, if they are truth preserving in a way that we will prove in a future video, then we shouldn't be able to prove both the proposition and it's contradictory. If under the assumption of some additional pro premise, some additional categorical proposition, we are able to prove some formula and it's contradictory, then something has gone wrong. Our, admit, our original assumption has to be the thing that we have to get rid of. So that's the background idea. Let me give you the schematic form of the rule. Let me bring up my whiteboard so that you can see what we're doing. And the basic idea for the reductio ad absurdum rule, so this is reductio ad absurdum, or as we will write, just RAA. Here, if you have some assumption, so this is a new additional kind of hypothesis that you are making in the case of your proof, then you, if you can prove from that hypothesis, both some categorical proposition and it's contradictory, then you can take the contradictory of your original assumption and write it down back in your original proof. So what this looks like is, so if, I'm just gonna write out the, the rule first and then give the schematics. If from an assumption on some line I of a well-formed formula, categorical proposition phi, and the annotation that we will give is just going to be assumption. Ooh, I'm going to run out of space. Uh, assumption. So if from that assumption, it is possible to prove using our other proof rules on line J, which comes after line I, some well-formed formula psi, and on line K, which is also going to be later on in the proof after line I, the contradictory of psi. So if we can prove both psi and it's contradictory, then we can take the contradictory of phi our initial assumption and write it 
on line n. And the scope line that we start at the initial assumption at line i is going to be closed at line k. So the annotation for this entire hypothetical move will cite the entire little hypothesis all the way down to the second pair of our contradiction. And these lines from i to k will be called a sub proof. So it's like a proof embedded within a proof. Schematically, it will look like this. We have our initial scope line, we have our premises, we've got a variety of things to do. And then at some point we're gonna say, okay, I am now going to assume the contradiction of what it is I'm trying to prove. So we'll do this on line I, and this is going to be some formula phi with the annotation assumption. If then, from there, at line j, we can prove psi from whatever root rule. And at line k, we can prove the contradictory of psi, which I'm just going to indicate by psi with a bar over the top. So whatever proposition psi is, psi with the bar is just the contradictory of it. And again, it will have an annotation. We don't necessarily know how. But if we have this here, and this entire thing is called a subproof, then we can close off this little mini proof inside. And at line i, we will write the contradictory of our assumption here at line i. So the annotation for this is reductio ad absurdum from lines i to k. So we're not citing individual lines like we do in the transformation rules or pairs of lines like we do when applying axioms, but we're citing the entire range of lines from I to K. The entire subgroup is part of our justification. Now, there is a constraint on this particular rule, namely that you can only use it once. So you can only use RAA once in a given proof. So nothing that we want to prove using this method ever requires us to use it more than once. So it just makes things easier if we specify that, uh, that we don't. Only two of the syllogisms require the use of this rule. They are Bocardo and Barocco. I'll give you an example of one of them and leave the other one as kind of an exercise to the reader. But let's see, I think I'm going to have to clear my whiteboard in order to be able to fit everything in. So make sure that you have a good understanding of what we're doing. We have premises, we have other things that we might do in our proof. And then in order to get the conclusion that we want, we will start off by assuming the contradictory of it, trying to derive a contradiction from that, so a pair of sentences that are contradictory, and then we can say, okay, our original assumption was false. It has to be the case that the other one is true. So let's see exactly how this works. So they are all drawn. Excellent. So I will give you a proof of Bocardo. Bocardo is the syllogism that has P-O-M as its major premise, S-A-M as its minor premise, and from this, we conclude POS. So this is a uh, sorry, third figure syllogism. We start off with our scope line and writing down our two premises. Major premise POM, line one. Minor premise SAM, line two. Both of these annotated with premise. Now, what I want to do is I want to prove POS. What I'm going to do is I'm going to assume the contradiction of POS. So the contradictory of an O claim is an A claim. So that means I'm now going to say, well, suppose that in fact, PAS is true. So here we are making an assumption. 
Well, I can always, with reiteration, move something down into one of these subgroups. So I will take premise two and write it down here. So this is reiteration of line two. And now I've got, by now you should be able to start recognizing when we have this kind of first figure pattern, we have a predicate term, a subject term, and the middle terms forming a diagonal. Both of the copulae here are A, which means that I can apply the axiom Barbara at this point. If I do that, this will get me P, A, M. So the predicate of the major premise becomes the predicate of the conclusion, the subject of the minor premise becomes the subject of the conclusion, and this is the result of applying Barbara to lines three and four. But now, let's go back and look at our premises again. At line one, we have that P-O-M. So I'm going to reiterate this. So that's a reiteration of line one. And now on lines five and six, I have a contradictory pair. P-A-M is the contradiction of P-O-M. They cannot both be true at the same time. They cannot both be false at the same time. If one is true, the other one has to be false. So if we could derive both of these, then something would have gone wrong with our proof rules. And I will show you later, I will prove to you later that nothing goes wrong with our proof rules. So the problem has to be with this assumption that we made. We said, oh, well, suppose that all S are P. No, we can't do that. This is a problem. Therefore, it has to be the case that some S is not P. So our conclusion on line seven, POS, is justified through the use of reductio ad absurdum, lines five, sorry, three to six. And look at that. That is, in fact, exactly what we wanted to prove. So here's Bocardo using proof by contradiction, the hypothetical method, reductio ad absurdum. You'll find all of these different ways of saying it. We will just use RAA because it's the easiest to abbreviate. Now, as I said, you can also prove Barocco using this method. I will leave that as an exercise for you. It's going to be a very similar proof. There's just going to be a little bit of cleverness in making sure that you get your propositions in the right order so that you can apply the axiom when you need to. I, it's hard to motivate and explain the RAA rule sometimes because it's only used in two of them. So I could give you both proofs, but then what would be the point of me teaching you the rule? You would never have any, uh, any opportunity to use it yourself. So I can give you one example. You can try to figure out the other one yourself. And because these are the only two you need to know it for, once you've proven these two, you don't ever have to remember the reductio ad absurdum rule in the syllogisms ever again. However, we will talk about it again, not next video, but the video after. Next time, I'm going to talk to you about all of these weird names that we've been using. Barocco, Bocardo, Cesare, Camestres. Why? What's the point? Tune in next time and find out. Cheers.